Welcome to Longmont Voices and Vision, a project of Longmont Public Media. In the midst of the darkest period in our lives, when we're bombarded 24 hours a day with news of the coronavirus and the human and economic carnage it's causing in our society, we're challenged to cope with our fears and anxieties while remaining hopeful about what lies on the other side of this crisis. This project presents an opportunity for Longmont residents to share with others how they're adjusting to new realities of social distancing and the kind of future they hope to experience on the other side of the crisis. I'm Tim Waters, host of these conversations and a Longmont Public Media volunteer. In this series, I'll be asking Longmont residents, many of them your friends and neighbors, three questions. What are you doing to get through this crisis? Even though we cannot be together right now, how are we staying connected to friends and families? And what's the future you are hoping to see and experience on the other side of this crisis? I hope you'll stay with this series and enjoy listening to your friends and neighbors and learn from them how they're getting through and what they're looking forward to in a new reality on the other side. Lisa Searchinger, thank you so much for your contribution to this Longmont Voices and Vision Project. Each of these interviews have started by giving us a chance to learn something about the interviewee. So I'm gonna ask you to start by talking about who you are and what you do. Take it away. Thank you for inviting me to participate and thank you for creating the platform for all of us, many of us uh, to share our experiences and our opinions. Um, I'm Lisa Searchinger. I'm executive director of Recovery Cafe Longmont, uh, which has been open just under a year. Uh, we started in, we are continuing to operate in the basement of Central uh, Longmont Presbyterian Church. And we were hoping to move out into the community in the next few years, but that possibly could be on hold now because of the crisis. I don't know what that's gonna mean for our next phase. The goal was to be in the basement for two to three years, but considering the recession that's uh, hitting us, potentially a depression, I don't know that we're gonna be able to move locations, but I'm hopeful. We'll see what happens. We'll see how quickly we can get beyond this. And I, my previous um, occupation was executive director of Hope Homeless Outreach Providing Encouragement. And I continue to work with uh, populations that are marginalized in our community. Well, Lisa, in addition to thanking you again for your contribution, your thanks for all that you do every day in addition to what you're doing right now with this interview. You know, I'm gonna ask you three questions and the first is that in this period uh, in which not, an experience none of us have ever lived, right? No one on the planet has gone through what we're going through right now. Uh, with all of the uncertainty, the unknowns and the, and the fears that go along with that, uh, people are finding their way through this and there's something to learn from everyone who is doing it. So, how are you finding your way, working your way through this? I'm very, very blessed. Um, I have a home. I have a very demanding job that keeps me distracted, sometimes too demanding, um, but I'm, I'm very, very grateful to have it. It keeps me, um, as I said, distracted and also um, challenged. Every day it's a challenge, I find that I'm probably working more than I ever have. And I've, I've um, checked in with some colleagues and they're saying the same thing. Like we're, we're just we're continually surprised, like why is it so demanding to be working in a crisis? But it is. And as you said, we really have nothing to compare this to. So, I mean, I, I think back of the flood, uh, the 2019 flood when I was working at Hope. And that was really, it, it was, it was um, devastating, but it was, much shorter the recovery process was longer but the actual crisis part where we were working with uh, our, our our clients to try to get through it was was pretty quick um this is obviously going to take much longer um but I, I i i don't know what i would do if i didn't have a demanding job i'd probably be going out of my mind 
Um, I make sure that I get out every day that I possibly can and go for at least an hour walk. I um, put on my headphones and I, unfortunately, I listen to the news. I shouldn't, I should probably be listening to music. On the weekends, I allow myself to listen to music, but it's like I've got NPR on, so it's, it's just, sometimes I, I can't get out of my own way, uh, but I know that I need to be better about self-care and recharging because it's it's going to be a marathon not a sprint to get through this um and i want to be able to help guide our members and our volunteers um and and anybody else that i my staff uh through this so i need to take to stay healthy and be good about self-care but an hour walk really seems to center me and um give me the energy that i need to be able to get through what i'm about to face for the day so that's, but I, that, but I, I really am blessed. I mean, I, ha, I have a place to shelter. Um, I have uh, a loving husband who supports me uh, and um, I have healthy children who are not living at home. Um, they're older and they have their own places. I, I really feel for some folks who are working at home and they've got little ones running around and they have to help them with their schoolwork and they still have to maintain their, their job. So really, um, Personally, I am, am blessed and I'm in a, a, a very, very um, lucky place. Uh, certainly there are, there are challenges that, that some are facing in this time that others are not. And uh, yeah, we're all lucky, those of us who have a chance to, to be, stay productive and active and, um, and, and be sheltered and have food, enjoy opportunities that, that others don't right now. Yeah, yeah. The um, the second question I'm going to ask uh, has to do with how. I mean, you mentioned your your loving husband, but you have grown kids. Uh, you also have lots of friends, and I'm certainly have more family. So, how you stay connected with friends and family during this time of physical distance and physical separation and social social distance? Um virtual meetings, uh, a couple of Zoom calls we've, I've had with extended family and with, with friends. But it, it's, um, it's interesting because I, I find that we're talking on the phone more. Um, texting seems to be taking a back seat. Friends that I haven't heard, friends that I used to see, um, have picked up the phone and I'm like, oh my goodness, it's Kathy. Um, I wonder why she's calling me. But she said, just, I, I don't want to text, I want to talk. And I've started to do the same. We've had um, long conversations at, on my walks, which is fun. Uh, just to walk, a, a friend that I usually walk with, I can't, but we're both walking separately in, in separate parts of the city, but we're talking on the phone. Um, so the phone uh, has become, kind of, there's a renewed interest in talking on the phone. And um, we're very thankful to have the technology to be able to have virtual conversations like you and I are having right now. Um, my kids might come over this Sunday uh, if the weather's good and we'll, we will wear masks and be outside uh, and hopefully be able to share a glass of wine together or a meal together. We're, we haven't been able to do that yet. We keep talking about it, but. I want to make sure that we're doing it safely. I was on a Boulder County call earlier this afternoon where Jeff Zayek, who's the director of Boulder County Public Health, was giving us an update. And as much as I want to see my kids, I don't know that it's the right thing to do. Masks and all. Yeah. Tough. That's part of the challenge, for sure. It's tough. That's, yeah. that's something I miss, is being with friends and family. Uh, yeah. It, the. Uh, who knew that phones were actually used to speak with people, right? <laughs> they were used it for everything else. That was kind of a lost purpose until recently. Um, but my last question for you is, uh, based on the presumption that uh, whatever was normal for us before this pandemic, life is going to be different on the other side of the pandemic. There will be a new normal. We're just not certain what it's going to be. But given that, we have a chance to influence what that is. So what would you like to see as the new normal and help create as the new normal on the other side of this? The overwhelming 
reality uh, that I just am haunted by and, and keeps me up at night is the depth of the inequities that we are witnessing now, how the, the curtain has just been ripped off. Um, we knew, but not the depth of what we know now and how people who are marginalized, who don't have resources are, are suffering at such a greater level than those of us who do have resources. And if we can have a conversation, if we can talk about social justice and really talk about social justice and what it means to be a human being and how everybody has rights, everybody should have a right to shelter in place. If you're experiencing homelessness, you can't shelter in place. Um, if you're living five, six to an apartment, you can't have safe, safe social distancing. If you can't work at home virtually and you have to go to work because that's your employment and you, you can't be protected, that's not fair. That's not justice. Um, I, I, I know this is a global issue. It's not just a local issue, but we have to have a conversation about it. We have to do something about it. Um, what in, in my lifetime, I've witnessed the disappearance of the middle class. I was raised in a middle class family. My parents did not go to college, um, but we had more than enough than we needed. I was able to go to college. I'm the first uh, generation. I, I just see the bifurcation of our society, of our American culture, and it tears me apart. Um, and, and, and just witnessing the people that we serve at the Recovery Cafe and listening to them and witnessing what they're going through, it, it's, it breaks my heart. And it's just, it's, it's, it's not right. And social justice, the common good, we, we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our neighbors, we owe it to the, to, to the world. This has to happen. I mean, and, and, and when, I, when I see what's happening here, it pales in comparison to what's happening in places like India and Africa uh, and the slums of Brazil. People, entire communities, cultures are gonna be wiped out by this and it doesn't have to be that way. It shouldn't be that way. It's a big conversation, but we have to start somewhere. Well, Lisa, I think you've started us in that conversation with this interview. And I don't think it's going to end with this interview. Uh, so I look forward to picking this conversation up with you and others in this community from whom I am hearing these interviews, uh, when we can uh, re-engage with one another uh, in, in settings other than virtual, uh, be in proximity, and, and, and continue creating the, the future we'd like to see. So thanks for contributing to that thinking. Thanks for contributing to this project and thanks for all the contributions you make day in and day out. Stay safe, take care of yourself and, and your family. Thanks, Tim, you too. Mark Cowell, uh, thank you for your willingness to contribute to this Longmont Voices and Vision project. Each of these interviews, we've started by learning something about the person being interviewed. So tell us about you, and tell us about what you do in Longmont. Sure, uh, my name is Mark Cowell and I currently serve as the Executive Director at the Hour Center. Uh, I started on July 1st of last year, so only about uh, 10 months into the job. Um, I currently live in Erie with my wife Dawn. Uh, we have one son, Dante, who lives in Louisiana, has graduated from college and becoming an adult now on his own. Um, I have served over 20 years in the nonprofit community. I spent most of that time working in the world of individuals with developmental, uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, had an opportunity about five, six years ago to make a shift in my career and was trying to figure out what that looked like and what that meant. And I just happened to get connected with Sister Carmen Community Center in Lafayette and uh, Suzanne uh, Crawford, the executive director, was a colleague of mine. And, um, she had her director position or director of programs position available and it sounded very intriguing. 
Um, and uh, I took the position and realized this was what my passion was. This is what I wanted to finish doing for the rest of my career. So uh, I served in that position for five years and uh, really got to learn the Family Resource Network and how Family Resource Centers worked and how vital those centers were in our communities to help families and individuals who uh, were struggling just to meet their most basic needs. And um, I learned a lot in that position, and, and when Edwina started talking about retirement, I was very interested in um, possibly coming over and being the executive director here at the Hour Center. I knew the great work that was being done here, how well respected the organization was, and I was ready to tackle an ED role again, which I'd been in previously. So it just seemed like a really good fit at the time, and one thing leads to another, and I was very fortunate to get the job, and I'm sitting here today. Well, and Longmont's fortunate that you got the job, so. Thank you very much. Um, Mark, you know I'm gonna ask you three questions, and the first of the three questions is, is this. Uh, none of us have ever experienced what we're experiencing right now. Uh, uh, at least those of us alive, there have been times in history where there might have been this kind of um, uh, unknown uh, and, and the concern and the anxiety that goes along with that. Um, so in this time of uh, so much uncertainty, how are you getting yourself through this period of time? Sure. I, for me, it all starts with attitude. Um, even before this pandemic, you know, I, I always try to start my day with the right attitude. Um, and that's what I'm doing right now. I'm doing my best to start the day with the right attitude, be positive. Of course, some days that's easier than others. Um, you know, this, this does wear on you. Um, you know, here at the Hour Center, you know, we're hearing stories of people struggling, people who are in positions they've never been in before, and uh, that takes its toll on you. Um, but one thing I've also learned is to be very self-aware of where I am mentally, um, as well as physically. And in the past, you know, I've had things like the gym to go to and, and things like that that I can't do now just because of the stay-at-home orders. Um, but I still have other means, you know, I, I can crank up the music. Uh, sometimes I'll turn, I'll shut the door to my office and uh, put some Johnny Cash on or a little John Bonamassa just to, to change the vibe of the room and kind of change the vibe in my head. Um, and sometimes I just take the day off and, and I'll go home and I'll unplug and I'll, I'll just isolate myself from the noise around me. And, uh, you know, maybe it's just working out in the yard where it's peaceful and quiet or, or going in the garage and wrenching on my old Jeep. Just something that I enjoy where, you know, I can get away from those energies that drain me and start recharging the batteries. And um, usually it doesn't take too long as long as I identify that early on. Um, I, it doesn't take a long, very much to get recharged. And that's kind of the goal. So I can get right back at it the very next day or, you know, 30 minutes later, whatever the case may be. Well, as you're, as you're recharging, and it sounds like you've got a variety of ways to do that, um, you're doing that in a context where you can't be physically close to the people who you'd like to be close to. In, so in this period of physical separation and social distancing, what are you doing uh, to stay connected to family and friends? Sure. Well, um, there's always texting, um, but the one thing I didn't know what Zoom was until <laughs> this pandemic. Now I'm like a pro. <laughs> yeah. so, um, you know, we we always, my wife and I, every Sunday night, we call we call our son and his girlfriend and just how are things going and checking in and, and keeping that connection. But now we're we're using Zoom, so now we get to add a face and with the name and you know it's always good to hear from family but it's even better when you get to see their face and see the smiles and and share the laughs and it's it's not as good uh, it, it's certainly better than just sitting on the phone or texting so um, you know we, we do that with our son every week we do that with other family members every week you know we get all of us on the um, the zoom call together so you see everyone's faces together which is is pretty cool and you know we had the Brady Bunch joke like everyone else did with all the screen around and looking at each other so you know it's, it's just light-hearted moments like that um, getting to share with with family and, and friends and um, you know, I, I have no doubt that, that once this is past us, you know, we're still going to be using Zoom and video teleconferencing. It's just, it's opened up a new world that we didn't realize was there. And, and right now it's, it's the best we got. And it's, you know, it, it's good. It's good. It's working. Well, um, you made reference to when this is past. So let's think about what, what life is like when it's past. And, and uh, we're all hopeful, obviously, that, um, that, the, that the, the end is in sight out there, some in the relatively near future. But for right now, 
uh, we're in the middle of it. And uh, as we're in the middle of it, reflecting or anticipating what's to come, uh, my last question is based on the presumption that whatever is to come is gonna look different than what was before the pandemic. That there'll be a new normal, we just don't know what it is yet, uh, but, there'll, but life will be different. So the question is, based on that presumption, what would be your preferred future? What would you like to see in that, in that new normal? and help to create in that new normal. Sure. You know, the, the very first thing that comes to mind for me is I would love to see uh, a collective shift in our mindset. Um, and what I mean by that is, is you know, in our, our society right now, you know, I see it every day. Um, you know, I have friends, I have people that I respect, and even sometimes I fall in this trap where we're so quick to judge, we're so quick to point the finger, we're, we're so, you know, we, we're just looking to find the fault in what someone else is saying if they don't agree with our viewpoint on something. Um, and, you know, that's been there and that's been growing now for a while. And I really feel like this crisis has really amplified that mindset um, all around us. But at the same time, I've seen a lot of great stuff happening um, during this crisis in our neighborhoods. Um, you know, I'm seeing more kids out and families spending more time with their kids and, you know, neighbors reaching out to each other. How are you doing? Is there anything that you need? Are you guys healthy? Are you guys okay? Um, you know, to the, the Longmont community, um, the, the support we've seen here at the Hour Center um, has just been off the charts and has been truly inspiring from individuals to groups saying, hey, here's a check. This is, you know, it may be 50 bucks, but this is what I can offer. And that's awesome. And, you know, all the way up to we've seen people offering $10,000 donations, donating 100 lunches for our hot meals. I mean, the list goes on and on. So, um, you know, for me, what I'm hoping is when this pandemic is in the rearview mirror, um, you know, we all realize that we're in this together. Um, and if we walk into a situation, as we see someone um, or a family who might be struggling, or if we're having a conversation with someone who perhaps, you know, doesn't share the same values or viewpoints as us, um, I would love if more of us would, would realize that we're in this together, have an open heart, have an open mind, give people the benefit of the doubts, and, and, and listen, and, and realize that, you know, 90% or more of everyone who's out there are good people, and have good intentions, and I think if we took that viewpoint before um, pointing the finger or getting on the defensive and, and trying to find that gotcha moment where they might be wrong, um, I, I just think we would be in a much better place. We could find solutions that work for all of us um, and we could move our communities, our neighborhood, our country forward instead of this bickering back and forth. So, you know, I know there's a lot of people who are looking at the policies behind what has to happen moving forward and what has to happen out there in the community. But I think until we can at least sit down and have a conversation together and have an open and honest conversation, respect each other. I'm not sure any of that other stuff is going to have as significant of an impact as it could um, moving into our future. Um, you know, and as for me, yeah, I'm in a unique position being here at the Hour Center. I get invited oftentimes to go talk with individuals or groups about the work we do. And a lot of our the work here, you know, that respect and that. Empathy is embedded in the work that we do. So I get that platform to share um, that viewpoint with people. Um, you know, they can take it or leave it, but I get that opportunity. It's a, it's a platform that, that, that I've inherited with this position and I try to make the most of that. Um, and I also try to lead by example. Um, I always try to treat people with respect. I, I have friends on all spectrums, whether it's religious, political, backgrounds, you know, I, I think I do a pretty good job of getting along with everyone. And I think it's just because, you know, I'm going to treat you with respect. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, sometimes to a fault, I'm going to trust you until you blow that trust. And sometimes that happens and it hurts, but I also understand that part of it. And I'm willing to take that risk. So hopefully by leading by example, uh, you know, more people will say, hey, that I like that interaction. Or I like how he interacts with others. I'm going to try to incorporate some of that in how I work with people. So um, hopefully a little bit of what I do is, is good and rubs off on others. Well, I'm sure a lot of what you do is good and, and I'll join you in hoping that it rubs off on others. So what you described earlier in your response about the kind of future you're envisioning is certainly one that's worth moving toward. So 
Uh, God bless you for the work you do. Thank you for your contribution to this project. And as I said earlier, to all of the other, thank you for all the other contributions you make for so many lawn lawners. Thank you. I appreciate that. So take care of yourself. Stay healthy. And uh, when, we, when we're out from underneath these stay-at-home and safe-at-home orders, uh, our paths will cross in the kinds of meetings that we've enjoyed prior to now. So. Yeah, I'll look forward to it. Yeah, take care. You too.